it's my pleasure also to welcome everyone to this second session in a diptych on translation versus inclusion and slash exclusion. But it is also already the third year that we host a diptych of events together with the British School and Eora Press. And it's always a pleasure to do so. I build also on the wonderful work done last week when Professor David Holden led the session with Mika Carlone Provata, Karis Psaras, and Claire Heywood, a session that is now available, as John said, on the channel uh, for you to watch. A lot of topics will come up. Again, topics related to time, places, people, insiders, outsiders, but our speakers will also for sure bring up the topic of the medium, the different kind of medium, the non-conventional medium. And I already see an important question arise that may well be related to whose narrative eventually gains the upper hand as we engage with the texts that our speakers have chosen. Let me then say a little bit more about the sequence of our speakers and properly introduce them. We push chronologically back in time. Our first speaker will be Ruth Padel, who takes us from the present to the Second World War. Therese Sellers pushes back to the early part of the 20th century with connections to the writing period of the work in, uh, at the time of the occupation of Greece. And then with Soluk, we go all the way back to the 19th century to 1821, but also with the present connection because 2021 is only a few months away. A few personal introductions then. Ruth Padel, our first speaker, is an award-winning British po poet, author of 12 acclaimed poetry collections, a wildlife novel set in India, and non-fiction work on Greek tragedy, poetry, and the influence of Greek myth on rock music. She's a colleague here at, at King's College London, where she is professor of poetry, and she's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Her lifelong links to Crete began when she was a student on a dig with the British School at Knossos. For the last 15 years, she has been very involved with the synagogue in Ganya, which is also a focus of her recent book, Daughters of the Labyrinth, about which she will tell us more tonight. Therese Sellers joins us from Massachusetts. She, studies ancient, she studied ancient Greek at Harvard, where she also took classes in modern Greek and studied modern Greek poetry with, you guessed it, Yorgos Savidis. She eventually went on to earn a PhD in modern Greek literature and translation from Boston University. She first came to Greece in 1987 to follow in the track of the Philhellene, the Philhellene American, Eva Palmer Sikelianos, and she's kept up a close connection with Greece ever since. I like how Greece is addictive for all of us. Therese worked for many years as a teacher of Latin and Greek, but she's also the author of Alpha is for Anthropos, a collection of nursery rhymes that she composed to teach ancient Greek to children. And tonight she will fe feature her translation of Elias Venesis, Eolikihi, which she translates as Land of Aeolia. I should show the books while I have them here. Andonis Nikolopoulos, or Luke, is a cartoonist who does work for several newspapers and magazines in Greece. He's, he studied political science at Pandio and obtained a PhD in cultural technology and communication from the University of the Aegean. He's currently engaged in a postdoctoral research project on the depiction of the Greek Revolution from 1800 to the present day. And his graphic novel, the focus of our discussion tonight, is part of that project. He has published 17 books with comics and cartoons and a monograph based on his doctoral research and examination of the Greek history of comics. His first graphic novel is Aivali, which came out in 2014, has been translated in many languages and won major awards. With his second graphic novel, The Collector, six short stories about a bad wolf, he negotiates a family situation after a bad divorce and especially a father's sense of alienation from his own child. 
His last graphic novel, Ima well, <laughs> Heavy to Lift, Imagi Displatias, is of course again deserving of many accolades and the focus of tonight's presentation. Our speakers will present one after the other. After that, I will give them a chance to interact with each other. In the meantime, John will be collecting your questions and those questions come, can come in at all times. And we will then invite our speakers to respond to your questions. And we hope we have very many of them. Well, thank you for joining us and enjoy. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just trying to share my share my screen properly. There. Um, thank you so much, Gonda. I'm really excited to hear the other panelists and um, happy to share with you what I've been doing. And first of all, these few slides are going to gallop you through the story on which my novel depends. But I wanted to talk about um, the what it is to write a novel about the Jews in Crete when I'm neither Cretan myself nor Jewish. Um, I thought my 40 years of, of living closely with in Crete, with Cretans, first of all, based on in Knossos and then in Chania. Um, I hope that validates me, but I'm ready to talk about anybody who thinks that um, appropriation is a problem. Um, I wanted, ah, um, Gondo, I've got a problem. I've, I've got, in my screen, I've got a whole lot of writing, but, but your windows, your pictures are filling up the writing and I can't see it. What do I do about that? I've if been... you mouse over the top of the set of windows yeah. and click the very small bar on the left, we'll all disappear. Very small, oh, I, oh, I see, all right, okay, fine. Okay, so I wanted, I think that all these um, books, all these presentations are going to occupy this area, um, the sea between Asia Minor and Greece, Turkey and Greece, but also Crete. Um, and we're talking about languages, the space between languages, which came up last week in the last presentation. And also I want to think about, um, uh, how do I go up? I'm so sorry. Um, John, how do I how do I go up? If you click on your PowerPoint rather than the Zoom window. Ah, okay, but I, but this is going down. Can I go up? How do I go up? Oh, I see. Okay, fine. Okay, so um, I, I gave you a taste of that sea on the map, the sea between the space between cultures and languages. And I wanted to remind you all of what Aristotle said that metaphor was, because this is about translation and the Greek um, equivalent of translatio is metaphora. And Aristotle called metaphora a carrying across from a home place to a foreign place. And um, I just, this little blue dot is where the Jews of Crete finally died. And that will become clear later for those of you who don't know the story. Um, I wanted to remind you that um, of George, what George Steiner said, the Trojan War, in, in the Trojan War, the fall of Troy is the first great metaphor of tragedy and the extraordinariness of Homer, of the Iliad, of a culture that is projecting its own culture onto another culture and is talking about the, the um, destruction. So this was where the Jews of Crete died, just off Santorini. These are two of the people who were on that boat, Sarah and Yudeta Cunha. And this picture was taken in 1943 in Chania um, and was taken by their non-Jewish school friend. I guess they're about sort of 12 and 13. This is Chania. For those of you who don't know it, here is that's where the Jewish quarter is, but, and where the last synagogue is, but, um, they weren't, Jews weren't confined to it. The, when the Venetians had held Chania, they put walls around it and made it a ghetto. The Turks took, took them down and many more Jews came. And, um, you know, so the Jews had a much better time under the 
uh, Turks than they had under the Venetians. And they spread all over. So very rich Jews, for instance, lived down by the law, law courts and so on. This is what Hanya looked like after three weeks of bombing. <clears throat> the Germans, as you probably all know, um, you know, did carpet bombing of the three major cities before they invaded by air. And, you know, a lot of English language um, books about that time focus on the British and resistance in the mountains. But there are books published in Greece about what it was like to live under. And I was interested in that experience, what it was like for the Cretans to live through that bombing and then in that town. It was possible to escape. And those who's escaped to the mountains found, of course, a different culture. And I just want to go back to those two Jewish girls, Jewish girls, and they're not starving, obviously, um, although there was a there was a famine in Crete, I mean, and it was very hard to get hold of good food, and they would hardly have been out of the city. So to go up there would be very different for them. And my story took off partly from that photograph of the two sisters, and partly from another um, story of, of a woman who people I have talked to and know have talk, used to talk to. Um, she was called Victoria Fermon, and she was out of the house with a non-Jewish boyfriend when the Germans arrested all the Jews in May 1941. So she escaped, but she and her boyfriend took her to the mountains where he died of pneumonia and she came back to a broken life nobody wanted to know. And so I put those two stories together. This is the synagogue um, as it was. Um, you know, when before it was rescued and here it is restored. Here's the interior. And also because I started with archaeology, because you can't ignore archaeology in Greece. It's it's a dominant metaphor for how you look at the landscape. Um, I'm interested in the underground spring and the mikveh, the ritual bath is a very rare in Greece, which they discovered when they were when, when Nikos Stavroulakis, who is the um, just amazing um, rescuer and restorer of the synagogue and the first director. And it's now directed by Anya Zukmantel, who is a historian and is doing wonderful work, both in outreach and in, in mapping the Jewish experience within the little city. But when the Jews were taken in 1941, in 1944, they were um, first of all put in this prison and everybody talks about it. And it's mentioned in George Psikundakis's book, uh, the Cretan runner, they talk there about if they're caught by in the, the, the Andartes in the mountains, they're taken to Ayas, where Haran has his kingdom of death and nobody ever escapes. So I went to see this place. It's, it's um, they, I, they didn't want me to photograph it. I walked around it. Um, it's anyway, there it is. And there's the boat they were put on, the Tanais. Um, Nobody knows why a Greek boat was called after a Russian river. And it was, the English had it for a time and it sort of half capsized <coughs> in Suda Bay um, and the, the English sort of uh, salvaged it. And then they torpedoed it, but not knowing who was on it. Who was on it was uh, the Cretan Jews, mainly from Hanya, a few from Rethymnon and, um, <coughs> and others from Heraklion, which had had a lot of synagogues. They were all destroyed in the bombing or during, during the occupation of the German occupation. So that means the little synagogue at Sayim in Hanyar is the only one left. It was originally a Venetian church. And anyway, they were all put on that along with some villagers from the Amari Valley um, in you know, um, well, recompense for having helped um, the, the British and the Cretans take General Kripa down to Alexandria, and some Italians. A few of the German crew, crew, crew survived. And it wasn't, it didn't come out for a long time how, what had happened to the Cretan Jews. So my story is about people. This is, they were 12 hours out from Heraclea when, when it was torpedoed. But I wanted to, Think about the people and the human experience 
And that's why I chose this picture for it's an early Salvador Dali, but I wanted, I, I, I Googled woman looking out, a painting of a woman looking out of a window at the sea. And I got something could, that could almost be Hanya. Um, those rocks could be Hanya, although it's on the Spanish coast. So in, in fine, I'm thinking really about what it is for a British woman to write a novel, imagining somebody who was born Cretan, who does not know that her mother was Jewish and went through the Holocaust. And in then radiating out from that, what it was like for that woman, Victoria Fairmont, to come back to an utterly orthodox uh, culture that wanted to forget that there ever had been Jews there. And what it is like now, for, well, also what it was like for her um, to go up to the mountains to this very, very different culture. And what, so it's, we're talking about spaces between cultures and links between cultures. So that's all I want to say for the moment, I'm, but I'm thinking very much about that sea between Greece and Turkey and what it contains. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Therese, next. Thank you, Ruth. Um, thank you, hosts, for uh, creating this event and uh, for inviting me. It's an honor. And um, greetings to the audience. Um, it's really cool how you're in so many time zones and spaces, and it's wonderful you're all here. So um, I have thought a lot about the theme of inclusion and exclusion both in the context of translation and in the context of the refugee experience. So Elias Benezis, whose book I recently translated, was an Asia Minor refugee. He came to Greece permanently in 1923 at age 19 after surviving 15 months as a prisoner in a Turkish labor battalion. He came as part of the population exchange mandated by the Lausanne Treaty in the aftermath of the Greco-Turkish War. This forced exchange of populations compelled 400,000 Muslims in Greece to leave their homes and go to Turkey. Um, interestingly, many of those from Crete. Um, and 1.2 million Greek Orthodox Christians were compelled to go from Turkey to Greece and not return. So this uprooting caused immeasurable trauma for both groups. One of the most amazing things about Venezis's masterpiece, Eoliki Yi, Land of Eolia, which was published in 1943 during the Nazi occupation of Greece, is how much light it contains despite this history and how Venezis uses fiction to create inclusion out of exclusion. And before I explain exactly what I mean by that, I would like to read the opening passage of Eoliki Yi in my translation, Land of Eolia, uh, because it is itself a creation myth. The book. When the waves of the Aegean parted, and the mountains of Lesbos began to emerge from the depths, damp, shining, and serene. The waves were astonished to see the island, their new friend. They were used to traveling from the regions around the Sea of Crete and breaking on the shores of Anatolia. All they knew of dry land were hard mountains, gigantic cliffs and yellow rocky land. But this, this new island was something different. How very different it was. And that's why the waves said, let's take the news to the nearest land, to the land of Eolia. Let's tell it about the island, the new land that married light with serenity. The waves came and brought the sea's news to the Aeolian shore. Other waves came and still others, all the waves. They told of the play of the island's lines, 
the play of harmony and silence. The first day that the hard mountains of Anatolia heard the waves, they remained aloof. They heard them the next day and still did not react. But then when it became too much, when every other second they heard nothing but the roar of the sea telling them about the miracle, the mountains gave up their indifference. Curious, they leaned over above the waves to see the Aegean island. They were envious of its harmony and said, let us too make a place of serenity in the land of Aeolia that will be just like the island. Then the mountains moved aside and drew back further inland. The place they left became the place of serenity. Those mountains of Anatolia are called the Kimindenia. Most of this book is set on this piece of land at the foothills of the Kimindenia Mountains, where Venezis and his four sisters spent every summer on their grandparents' farming estate. In the winter, they lived in Aivali, which is, of course, the title of Saloop's amazing graphic novel, which you might hear a little bit more about soon, I hope. Um, but I want to come back to the theme of inclusion uh, versus exclusion. So in the months following the catastrophic defeat of the Greek army in 1922, more than 1 million refugees arrived in Greece from Anatolia and Thrace. After their sudden expulsion from their native land, they faced a new kind of exclusion as refugees. In addition to suffering physical deprivation, the refugees were despised and mistreated by a society that did not view them as real Greeks. The refugees felt compelled to play down their Anatolian origins in an attempt to fit in. Venezis's book changed this. In his prologue to my translation, the historian Bruce Clark makes the point that the publication of Land of Eolia in 1943 broke a silence and a taboo among Asia Minor refugees about their homeland. By beautifully recreating the world of Anatolia before World War I with all its non-Greek idiosyncrasies and as his childhood Eden, Venezis gave permission to other refugees to express nostalgia for their homeland and to grieve. Beyond this, the incredible success of Venezis' work, as well as the work of many other Asia Minor writers of his generation, such as George Seferis, to name one, brought the Anatolian experience and sensibility into the Greek identity and imagination, an inclusion that we may take for granted now I don't have time to read you the last, um, the very famous last pages of Land of Eolia, but they are set on board a smuggler's boat as the family escapes from the farm from Turkey to Lesbos during the persecutions of Christians in 1914. I think it's appropriate to acknowledge that this scene of refugees in small boats crossing from Turkey to Lesbos tragically repeats itself in our times as people flee their homelands to a place where they are not welcomed. So finally, as we mark the centenary of the Asia Minor catastrophe of 1922, Land Veolia stands as a lyrical monument to lost Anatolia and to all our lost homelands. Thank you. Thank you. And we now proceed with Zulu.
Yeah, thank you. Hello, um, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to attend um, this event today. I would like to thank you all the organizers uh, and you Goda for a kind uh, invitation uh, with that uh, interesting um, um, and important event with uh, Ruth and Teres. So I try um, to share with you some uh, slides. Um, can you see it now? Okay. Um, um, my contribution concerns visual translations um, of history through comics. Specifically, I will focus on two of my graphic novels that deal with uh, uh, two significant moments of modern Greek history. Uh, the graphic novel 21, The Battle of the Square, Imagines Plateas, that talks about the Greek War of Independence in 1821. And the second, Ivali, a graphic novel about the Greek Turkish War in 1919 to 1922. In brief, uh, The Battle of the Square covers the entire period uh, of the Greek Revolution up until the accession of uh, the Bavarian King Otto. This graphic novel is the most extended comics work in Greece until now, combining uh, systematic historical uh, and archival research with uh, the comics. Uh, narration revises the dominant national narrative about the uh, Greek Revolution, highlighting familiar and less uh, well-known aspects of historical facts and the role that uh, historical figures played in them. On the other hand, uh, Aivali uh, deals with uh, the end of the Greek Turkish war in Main or Asia. According to the Treaty of uh, Lausanne, uh, Greek and Turkish governments agreed to the mass expulsion of Main or Asia's Orthodox and Turkish go and, uh, and the Muslims from uh, today Greek territories, respectively. Thus, about uh, one and a half million civilians forcibly driven out of their homelands uh, from both sides. Until now, uh, Aivali, uh, the older uh, graphic novel, has been translated in four languages. Uh, as you can see here uh, in Turkish, um, uh, in, in uh, French, uh, in English, and um, the last year in Spain, in Spanish. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's got a warm reception of, uh, from Greeks, of course, in Greece and, uh, and from abroad. Uh, both graphic novels try to revise the way we think about the recent history of our position and our position uh, as individuals and uh, as a society in it. That's why the main narrator's uh, point of view is placed in the present. The plot evolution is based on two parallel narratives, a central one that concerns today life, and the second discusses the past with chapters which interrupt um, uh, the central narrative. Chapters about the past, they work as flashbacks, are mainly based on narratives of people who uh, eyewitnessed those events, Specifically in uh, the Battle of the Square, the texts are written by fighters, Fanariotes, Kojabasis, um, Philelines, etc., that participated in Greek Revolution, or by authors uh, and historians who wrote uh, about the uh, Greek Revolution uh, later. In Naivali, uh, the chapters about the past are based on uh, works of four writers, three of them. Uh, our Greek, Fotis Kondoglu, as I say, I'll say before, Teresa uh, Elias Venezis, Agapi Venezi Molidiak, the sister of uh, uh, Elias, and Tuanis Turkis, uh, Ahmed Yorulmas, with uh, his origins uh, came from uh, uh, Crete. The different levels of time and are, depicted, uh, are depicted and easily perceived by different styles of uh, the sketch, as you can see here. 
Regarding the present, I prefer to use more realistic drawings uh, similar to photographic depiction uh, with gradations uh, of gray. You can see here uh, the today stories or from two books. Uh, in contrary, uh, for the depiction of the past, I use simpler black and white drawings. Um, therefore, the both graphic novels, uh, the various rivalries are translated into images and the issues of inclusion and exclusion in these specific historical periods become the object of narratives reflection, the feeling of belonging in a group or a nation and the hostility against the other. Reflections that uh, are particularly relevant with issues that concern us today, such as the national and religious fanaticism or the contemporary refugees flows in Greece that passed by uh, tragically the same places as then, uh, like the islands of uh, Lesbos, Chios, Samos, etc. The national narratives are mainly based on a characteristic division, we and the others. We usually represent the positive side and the others, a foreigner uh, or a believer of an, another uh, religion, represent the negative, dark or evil side. So very often we blame the others. Uh, we consider that the other is responsible for our uh, bad luck. For this reason, I wanted my graphic novels to contain this uh, dominant opposed interpretation and readings of history from both the conflicting sides as a way to see how people understand life and history from different points of view. In both crucial uh, historical periods, the main di dividing line is determined by the concept of religion, but also by the idea of belonging, a belief of inclusion into a specific national formation and culture. As expected in the 1820s and uh, in the graphic of the Battle of the Square, the main division is uh, the rivalry takes uh, of the rivalry takes place between the Ottomans and the Turks, and uh, the Greeks, sorry. But uh, on a second level, uh, we discover uh, more uh, subdivisions between uh, the Orthodox uh, the Christian uh, revolutionaries, inclusions and exclusions that are uh, determined by social, ideological, and cultural position but also from their demonstrations in the new power status that has just been uh, formed. Uh, here uh, upstairs, you can see uh, this division at the level of the power between politicians like uh, uh, Mavrokordatos or Coletis and uh, warriors like Kolokotronis, uh, Dimitris Ypsilandis, Officers and Duchos, uh, and respect respectively, at the level of uh, recording of history between the scholars and historians like uh, Spirit and Tripoupis here, and the fighters who wrote their memoirs, like Karpos Papadopoulos, Totakos, uh, and many others. Uh, in a value, the main conflict between Greeks um, and Turks is both national and religious. But here I try to approach the subject, subject not only from the side of the big history, the objective mention of dates, great diplomatic and uh, military events, but from um, the ordinary people's uh, little history, their micro history, uh, their um, reception of the way the war by people who lived the events and recorded them in their personal memoirs. Uh, one last element which also concerns today's discussion is the emergence of the difficult position the ordinary people faced in this uh, rivalry on both sides. In the Battle of the Square, this is not only depicted by the war atrocities against civilians, for example, in that uh, sketch uh, that depicted uh, the massacre of Chios, but also by the visual metaphor of a tiger man in an attempt to portray the savage fanaticism of the one side against the other. Uh, the deadly uh, prejudice is represented here using the same visual metaphor, both in the case of uh, the Greek invader in Ottoman uh, Tripoli here, 
and the, in the case of the Ottoman inventor in Greek mythology, with the same uh, pictures. Um, finally, in Aivali, we focus on stories that bring closer the human victims of uh, both uh, sides. Uh, perhaps uh, the culmination of conciliation occurs in the last chapter of Aivali, when the Greek narrator Discuss, discusses, discusses with the Turk. They are both uh, descendants of refugees from the period 1922 to 1924 after uh, the exchange population. And they discover a common ground in their national prejudices in the way they thinking the, and the demonize the other. Uh, they ironically perceive themselves as grandchildren of Lausanne a strange uh, kinship. Kin kinship. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Well, a big thank you to all of our panelists. I would now like to open the floor for our panelists to ask each other questions while you in the audience also sending your questions um, all along, so don't hesitate. Who wants to kick it off? You have a question, Ruth. I can tell. Go ahead. No, I haven't. I'm, I'm, um, I haven't got a properly formulated question. Um, I mean, I was so I was so excited to hear Therese talking about um, the land of Eolia. Um, it's um, I, I've been in Lesbos a lot, and it seems to me that Lesbos is is a sort of pivotal thing between between all of our presentations in a way. In in one scene in my book. Um, the the man, the the father of my of my main protagonist, who is now about ninety, he's been reading a paper. Um, there was a newspaper thing in a Cretan paper about um, two people who come from um, Turkey, and the the daughter, the little daughter, had fallen overboard um, on the way to Lesbos, and they were originally from Crete just as um, Therese said, and they were sure they would find their daughter. It was sort of, it's heartbreaking, of course. Um, but the, the, this man who had married a Jew, um, but she was passing as Orthodox because nobody wanted to know about the Jews when, when um, after the war, um, his daughter challenges him and says, why didn't you tell me I was Jewish? Why didn't you tell me about Mama's um, history? And he said, what do you want? Um, what should we do? We would have been like these people. We would have been without a home. Nobody wanted to know us. And um, it seems to me that picks up some of the things that Sir Luke is mm -hmm. talking about, and it resonates with... I mean, it's extraordinary that that book rescued a whole lot of people and made them able to tell their own stories, Therese. I mean, it's just wonderful. So did you talk to people? This is, this is my question, really. If, if Therese talked to people, um, in you know who've, whose grandparents came from the after the from Asia Minor in the 1922 disaster. Um, yeah, yes, definitely. I mean, there's one right here on the screen with us, right? And Donnie, aren't you aren't you a grandchild of Lausanne? Um, but but anyway, yes, certainly. And of course, being American, many of those people that I've I've talked to are are Americans, and this is something that I wanted to talk about in the context of the of translating the book so and and you know of course i lived in greece for a number of years and such a huge percentage of people who are greek are descendants of asia minor refugees so you couldn't have i couldn't have not met them but i guess the the group that i might focus on just in my answer right now is american descendants of asia minor refugees because the american descendants have something very different from the greek descendants which is for the most part by now, after all these generations, they don't speak Greek. So it's, and this is something that, you know, I wanna say just on the, the subject of translation, if you don't read Greek, you can't read, you can't read, Vene, you know, you, you couldn't read Venezis, you couldn't read, if you're Greek, you couldn't read. And so there's a dis, some of, I think for a Greek, descendant of the refugees, they can talk to their grandparents, they can talk to their great grandparents, but the Americans, it's more distant. So they know the history, but I think sometimes it's harder to connect to. And um, recently I've been in touch with a woman who actually just, I guess she she died um, 
a few months ago, but she, her father was from Turkey. He was an Asia Minor refugee who came to, to New York very, very early before, you know, before she was born. But in her last months, she wanted to sort of start revisiting some of these things. So that's a concrete example of an American Asia Minor descendant who didn't have access to the Greek language, except she, it was her culture and she had shadowy memory, memories of her father and she had this and she had that and of some of the Greek church services, he took her to New York. But I guess um, this long convoluted answer, Ruth, is what I'm trying to say is that, yes, I have spoken to descendants of Asia Minor refugees and part of my mission as a translator is to give them back, the ones who don't know Greek, to give them back something which I think is theirs. And that's, you know, this, this, well, this book and this narrative. Mm, wonderful. So did you want to add something to that? First, I'm muting yourself. Thank you. Yes, I have um, uh, two points uh, for uh, Ruth and Teresa um, that connect uh, us, um, our, our, our works. Um, first, um, I, I have to ask to Ruth, uh, uh, how is it was um, uh, is to, to translate and uh, render the Greek uh, atmosphere, uh, and especially the text uh, with the uh, Asian Greek uh, uh, language or um, the Cretan idiom in today, or maybe Matinades, etc. Yes. And, uh, and how it was to to convey uh, that feelings in uh, the English language and uh, uh, an English uh, audience, readers? That's a very, very interesting question. And I, actually, it ties in. I wanted to ask you how you got to the presentation of the past and the present. It's a sort of aesthetic, an aesthetic technical question in a way. And for me, the um, it took me 10 years, this novel. And when I first when I first wrote, wrote the first draft, my language would have sounded like a translation. For, I could hear the Cretan voices in my head. And, um, but it sounded patronizing. It sounded as if they didn't know English, that didn't sound right. And um, I read a lot of different novels in which people are, are writing say English but um, representing another language and I decided that the important thing was to get it con a convincing sort of language in English um, sometimes occasionally I will I will um, like when she meets she meets a very old man who's giving her some raki in a, in a village place and he the, the kind of the um, order of the words is more Cretan, it's more, it's more Greek than English. Um, but I didn't want to, I wanted to make it convincing English. So that was what I, that was my prime, my, my prime thing. And then I get the flavor of it, of, of Crete very much through, through the describing of the land. And, um, I chose to have an artist as, as the protagonist and to do it in her voice. And so she can do a lot of the, of the, the describing and how she sees the land. And so I wanted to sort of put the translation as it were of the, of the visual into, into the words, into the verbal um, by the intensity of her reaction. Um, so I suppose that was how I did it. I loved doing that. The Mantinades, I, I, I loved doing those. And, um, you know, and the, and the up-to-date Mantinades that talk about, you know, you are, you're my hard, my, my hard drive and things like that. I love <laughs> I mean, the, with the sort of fantastic Cretan humor that you get in the Mantinades. You know, I just put that straight into English. Um, it, was, it was lovely. Um, so um, that was, it was a very interesting question, but it took me 10 years to solve so loop. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> yeah. The point uh, that connect us was uh, Hanya because uh, my hero uh, Hasanakis uh, uh, came from uh, Hanya to Avalik. And, uh, and uh, may can I uh, another make another uh, question to Teresa? Sure. 
Yes, Absolutely. The, the other point that connects us there is, is um, Venice, of course, and um, the, um, um, the way that uh, you translate um, the text of uh, Venice and me um, translation in images, etc. Um, how uh, how it was uh, to, to, to your your feelings about uh, uh, the land of Eolia um, in a, in contrast in contrast with uh, the numero because uh, are two different um, um, books but uh, has many similarities. Uh, because uh, the first one, chronologically, uh, the numero uh, came uh, after uh, Venezia's um, feelings uh, of um, uh, after um, the labor uh, battalions uh, Ameleta Buru. Uh, and the second one, uh, as you, you said before, uh, uh, he wrote it in uh, in the in the period of. Uh, uh, German occupation in Greece and Athens. How it was the feelings? The, the first one is uh, very strong, and the second, uh, in chronological, but uh, the back memories of uh, a children in uh, paradise uh, of uh, Aeolia, uh, Earth, uh, is uh, so uh, tranquil. Or, uh... I'm so glad you asked about Tonumero. Um, Andoni, because it's 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 such an important book, and I actually I started translating it. Like I translated half of it into English, but well, I stopped because I found out there's um, actually a manuscript of another translation by somebody much more exciting than me as a translator. I won't say who, but there is another manuscript already out there that I think is going to get published. So I I stopped, but because I spent like a lot of this last year translating the numero because I didn't know this yet. Um, anyway, it's very much on my mind. So just to bring the audience in who might not know, this book, which was the very, very first book written by Elias Venezis, I mentioned that he came when he was 19 years old. He got, when he was 18, he, he was imprisoned in this, this brutal labor battalion. 3,000 men in his town were put into this, they were arrested in this big group. I think less than 20 survived. So it was, it was a death. It was not, you weren't intended to survive. They starved them, they put them on forced marches. It's extraordinary that Elias Venezi survived this experience. And when he did survive, he, he came, he was 19, he arrived in Lesbos and he started writing. And so this, he wrote and it was, um, they were published weekly. He just started right in the uh, newspaper. He started writing about his ordeal as a prisoner in the Turkish labor battalion. And this book bears a, a strong resemblance in my mind to the, the novel Night by Elie Wiesel, a young man, brutal experience, just a very, very clear description from beginning to end of what happened. And so he, it was um, published it, serially. And then in 1931, the chapters were brought together. It was published as a novel, hugely successful, translated into lots of languages, put him on the the map, you know, as a literary figure. Okay, so this is what's really interesting, Andoni and everybody. Uh, Venezis himself addresses that question, and I'm going to tell you what he said. Excuse me. Just... So, in his preface to the second edition of Tonumero, so Tonumero is this novel about this just brutal experience he, he has as a very, very young man, absolutely brutal. Everything you can imagine happens. He published that in 1931. During the German occupation, he wrote Eolikiyi. As soon as he finished Eolikiyi, he went back to Tonumero, which apparently he hadn't looked at once in those intervening, you know, whatever years. He hadn't looked at once. He brought it out and he revised it and he brought out a second edition. In his preface to the second edition, Venezis, which I translated because I thought I was translating the whole thing, but his preface to the second edition, he addresses this question. And I almost like copied it to read aloud today because it's so relevant. 
But what he said is, he says the German occupation brought out two conflicting emotions inside me, two conflicting needs. And the first need that the German occupation brought out in me was a need to revisit my childhood and to remember that there once was a thing called human beings, that there once was a thing called gentleness, kindness, serenity. And so what Venezi says is that he wrote Eoli Yi during the occupation as a personal need to express goodness in a time of terrible evil. But then this is what's so interesting. He said, the very first thing he did after finishing Eoliki Yi was to go back and to revisit Tonumero. So what he said was that in the occupation, two things happened and they both happened and they're opposites of each other. And one was a strong desire to express goodness. That's Eoliki Yi. And the other is a strong desire to explore the full depths of evil. And that's what that book is. And I, I, you know, in translating it, as you say, the books are very similar. I love his language. And in translating to Numero, I refound that tender, beautiful language, which is so lovely that it almost carries you through the horrors. Um, so that was a long answer, but, um, but since Venezis himself addressed it, I, I had to tell you what he said. It's so interesting because I was I've recently been rereading the schoolmistress with golden eyes, and Mirivilis has the same trajectory because I had forgotten how much of the horrors of what what happened in Turkey in 1922. Um, you know, there's a lot of that at the beginning of the book, and the, and the protagonist is trying to forget it, um, and then it, it ends up, of course, with with this bliss at the end. But there's, it encapsulates both. I think this would probably be a good moment after your very rich contributions and wonderful questions and uh, to, to see what our audience wants to hear from us. John, do you want to take a few questions? Oh, we have we have some questions in the uh, in the in the Q&A, so please do keep them coming. Um, first of all, a question from an anonymous attendee um, thanking us for organizing the event. Um, but the question is for all of the panelists, um, what motivates you to translate, either in the traditional sense uh, or translating events into graphic novels in the case of Suluk? So I don't know which order you want to take them in. Um, I'll, I'll begin. I mean, I, I think I, I discovered very early on that what I wanted to do was translate my experience of the physical world into words. And I think that's the that's the primary <laughs> motivation for any writer is to turn it into words so that you can, I suppose, so you can tell. And so <clears throat> when you have people in, in horrific conditions like Venezis or Mirivilis, um, the word, the urge to express for the, for the poet or the writer to be a witness um, and to share that witness is perhaps an important thing. So expressing the gap between self and other and myself, when I was studying ancient Greece, I, I was driven for 20 years. I was driven by, by the wish to, to translate their experience and our experience, not to say that they are the same, but to put them side by side and see the similarities. Others, Therese, so look, what motivated you to translate? You're muted. You're muted, you're muted. You can leave it unmuted for now since we uh, Sorry. Uh, my, uh, uh, my feelings about translation, it's, uh, it's uh, different from, uh, from you, yeah. and uh, uh, Ruth, of course, because uh, my work is tra translate uh, texts uh, in images and um, narrations through uh, words and images. Uh, another uh, point is uh, how translations of Ivani uh, comes to the broader audiences. Uh, and, and another point is uh, how, far, how difficult it is uh, Ruth to translate some Martinales uh, that um, uh, embodied in Ivani 
in English language from uh, Tomba Patrimitriu, uh, the translator of uh, uh, the English version. Uh, so uh, maybe it's more uh, useful to say that uh, um, the, the reverse direction of a translation of a value from a Greek language uh, to, to others, um, it's, a, a, it's a difficult, uh, as you know, uh, to translate something from a small uh, language uh, to, to the English or uh, other countries, uh, other languages. Uh, but uh, it was interesting that uh, the reactions uh, are different from uh, different points of view in, in, in each language. For example, in Turkey, we have the same uh, story uh, to share uh, with uh, friends from uh, the other uh, uh, side of the Aegean. Uh, and it's something that uh, concern uh, um, uh, us uh, Greeks as well. Uh, all these um, um, conflicts and um, the theme of uh, um, uh, of, uh, as I said before, um, we are grandchildren of, of Lausanne, where um, we have the same um, problem to share with uh, Turks. In uh, English version of uh, Aivali, translation of Aivali, uh, as I said before, uh, translated by Tom Papa Dimitriou, a Greek American uh, in the US and published by his brother, uh, Dean, um, in Boston, uh, Somerset Hill, um, Hill Press. Uh, so uh, it was um, uh, easy to, to understand that uh, what we saw um, in uh, the, the book uh, uh, presentations from uh, San Francisco to New York or Boston it was uh, welcoming uh, for us. Uh, the very interesting point is uh, for other languages like in France or now in Spain, that uh, uh, the, uh, these people, they, they didn't have to say something with that problem, the greek Turkish uh, um, relations. Um, or, uh, but they had, uh, they have other uh, points to share, and uh, it's interesting to translate a book like a Bali, like uh, um, um, uh, the differences between Christians and Muslims, um, the um, refugees flows uh, to Europe or uh, the tenses, uh, diplomatic uh, or uh, military tenses in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was uh, one interesting thing uh, in French edition of Faibali, uh, in Clermont-Ferrand that uh, we presented in 2016 uh, with a, a small uh, exhibition there was that uh, no one knows what happened in Europe before uh, uh, one century uh, with uh, exchange population and uh, all of these uh, humanitarian disaster. No one knows in, uh, in, uh, in Clermont-Ferrand uh, with friends uh, I, sp I spoke that uh, tragedy. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, that, the, that what um, Andreas is saying, when I've presented from Eoliki Yi, if you present to an American audience, you really have to explain the history. Mm -hmm. Like the, the date 1922 means nothing to, I think, to the average non-Greek. And to a Greek, 1922 is as, you know, maybe more important than World War I or World War II, what happened in 1922 with the end of the, you know, the catastrophe and the, the um, and the, the refugee emergency, that is just so, I always feel like it's complicated for me as a translator, I have to, you know, I want to go do a reading, I just want to go read from my book, but I am compelled to fill in a little history just to give that context. 
Um, but I would love just for one minute to answer the question about why I translate, because um, just for diversity, I have a different answer here, um, which I don't know, maybe it's kind of simple, but I think to be honest, for me, the compulsion to translate is the same as the compulsion to, at some level, to enact a text. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I read tragedy in college, I studied ancient Greek too, and I wanted to perform the tragedies. Like, I didn't just want to read them. I wanted to like, you know, perform them, get the words out. And, and so I think that I view translation as a kind of performance of a text. So when I read Eolikihi for the first time in Greek, I fell in love with that book. I was in love with the language and I want, and I guess, you know, if I had been a scholar of some type, maybe I would have wanted to write a dissertation about why it was so great, but I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't, I couldn't explain what I wanted to just turn it into English and show you how great it was. So I think for me, the, the, the compulsion to, to translate is actually comes from the same impulse as the impulse to perform. And the last analysis, right, the, the, you know, I talked about a script, a, a Greek play, you want to maybe perform it, but I, another way of looking at it is almost as like a musical score so that you, you would see Aoliki as this beautiful thing written in Greek and then think, whoa, I could perform that in my, my instrument, which is the English language. So that, so, so it's an impulse to, to share, yes, but maybe even in a different way to share as a performance. That's a beautiful metaphor, Therese. <laughs> Talking about metaphors, and I am struck by how the theme of meta and trans is at work on so many different levels. Not only, you know, through generations, there's something very intergenerational about all these stories. And for, so, look, taking that back to uh, exposing various generations to, to the historical events, even of the 19th century. So, there are every, every one of these works has multiple generations uh, at work, but there is also something uh, that puts the trans in square, let's say, and that is that a whole lot of these people who are the displaced are dealing with more than one displacement. As Therese was saying, there is, there is the rescue to the Greek lands, but they're not feeling at home, seeking a different kind of inclusion in the American lands. Uh, even in Greece itself, we see very often that these people were sent to some remote corner of uh, uh, Greek Macedonia, uh, back up again and move to the city. So there's more than once one trans happening also in, in physical terms. So the, and actually here I'm picking up on a nice question by Haris Saras. Are we all talking about narratives of displacement? Cretan Jews, Venezes, Ivali. Is there something particularly attractive or challenging when it comes to translations of narratives of displacement as opposed to translations of other narratives? So I think, yes, the displacement, the displacement through time, uh, certain generations feeling displaced from what they know, feel they should know about their family, but turns, turns out they, after all, they don't know their family all, all so well. They're displaced from what actually should be included in what the family transmits down the line. Uh, the displacement from what is most close to your family or place and seeing that in multiples, I think is what ties this all beautifully together. Can I just come in there? Because I think there's another word we need to throw into the mix, is, which is also identity. Um, mm. Because, I mean, the, the Jews of Crete felt Cretan. They, were, they had been there for, you know, since before Christ. And... Um, you know, many Jews fought in the Greek army when it went when it went to Albania to, to Alba you know to to fight in the Albanian campaign. There were Jews in the army there, and some of them, in fact, escaped escaped the the arrest because they were in the army or they were in the German prison. Um, so it's rather like it's not only, of course, in this context we have um, Jews who were in Berlin who felt German before they felt Jewish, or they felt both, and they didn't need to choose. So we all perhaps have, have different identities, but what's awful when you see photographs of people who just, they come to Lesbos from Syria now, um, they have to start being, um, trying to find the language, trying to find the identity in this place. Yeah, very much so. 
John, are there more questions? Did there you... are indeed, yes. So um, I was I, I was going to pick up um, Harris's, so we had a nice inter-panel uh, question, which is rather nice because he was with us last week. Um, so thanks for, for picking that out. Um, this one's specific to Saloop, and uh, it's from, again, from an anonymous attendee. Um, and the question is, do you ever alter the images in your books when they're published in different languages? <laughs> um, and they say they suppose they're asking whether images always mean the same thing to different cultures, or do we ever need to work to translate them, i.e. the images as well? need to unmute yourself yeah good. yes sorry yes i, can. I think uh, if i understand uh, well uh, the question um, uh, the way that to 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 speak for uh, some uh, for, for some things for our lives um, it, the important for a, 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 a reader uh, abroad is uh, to, to to say something important for uh, his life. Uh, so uh, uh, when you focus on uh, your problems, uh, maybe for uh, your memories or uh, your country, small country, etc. But uh, focuses uh, on the center of uh, uh, in the inner of um, of life. Uh, so um, that uh, that question uh, um, may be translated in something uh, uh, important for uh, the reader. So uh, if you have uh, images through uh, graphic novels, for example, that depict uh, uh, atrocities, or maybe some questions, or maybe some well-known pictures uh, from uh, uh, like Mons uh, uh, Cravie, or um, some other depictions that uh, say something uh, for a global audience, maybe you can translate uh, your feelings to other uh, 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 languages uh, to other uh, people everywhere. But but do you actually redraw the images for different uh, translated editions, or do you always use the same basic image, and the text is is actually translated for other languages? I, I can't understand the uh, the question. Uh, Sorry, I think the question is simply. I, if I leave, for example, that uh, is already translated. Is uh, one book that we have uh, different uh, uh, translations uh, and meanings about that. Sure, but is it is it always the same images in each in each translation? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, oh. so the, it's the language that's translated around the images. In other words, yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, a question now. I think actually for um, for Therese is about Venezis. Um, and the, the, this is Sebnem Senyener asks uh, if you could emphasize a bit uh, about Venezis' Greek and how different it was from that which was spoken in Athens when he was writing his novels. Maybe okay. a technical question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, uh, this is a little bit of a hard question for me, but, but because I don't know. But I, I basically think that his Greek was very similar. I mean, uh, an, you know, Ivali was a Greek town when um, Venezius was born there in 1904. It was a Greek town in the Ottoman Empire, but, you know, he went to a Greek school, he went to a Greek church, he went to, it was a Greek town. And as such, I think that his education, his language would be similar to a, a very educated person in, in, um, I'm not sure what we call it, mainland Greece, <laughs> peninsular Greece, but but so I don't think, no, I don't think, and um, I don't think his language, you know, his Greek would be substantially different. Yes, there was more use of Turkish in his Greek than there would have been in a, in a non-Anatolian Greek. And this is something I ran into as a translator and I literally took a course in Turkish 
when I was in graduate school, I, I took a semester of Turkish to give myself confidence to handle some of these. So, but it, so the, no, the language, I, I don't know. I just don't, I, and I've been asked this question before and I sort of, I feel as though maybe I'm not able to give as nuanced answers as I wish I could just from ignorance, but I think that, um, but no, Anatolian Greek, it was, it was Greek. Okay. Um, and Elizabeth Foden has a question for Ruth. Um, uh, she would like you to say a little more about your anxiety of appropriation uh, and also your, your feeling that you were patronizing in your initial drafts. Um, just a little bit more elaboration on that. And she apologizes that she, she may have already dropped off because her internet's giving her problems, but uh, she can watch the recording. I hope, I hope your, your internet's okay. Um, yes, I'll, I'll take the second one first. I felt that um, if you do translation ease, it sounds as if the person speaking is not properly capable of speaking. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to write from the, as it were, a colonial point of view and say, here is, here is my ordinary English. And now I'm describing somebody who is speaking broken English. So I really did not want to do that. I wanted to do it, everything as much as possible from the Cretan point of view. And in the end, I thought the best way to do that is to, you know, just to signal when, when it's, it's the person who is writing is, is, has actually, she, she starts off in England um, and then she has a sort of uh, she she's she has a sort of moment of Greek on the phone with one of her brothers, <clears throat> and I, I try to set that up like that, as you would really if you were writing it doing a play, plays where people speak different languages, they can do various conventions that mark out that now this bit of English is in another language not English, and I and um, I think that I hope that was clear. I had another problem actually, which was technically analogous to that, which was um, some of the some of it is in the present because the um, the narrator is talking, but sometimes she is narrating what her father says. And um, I did that sort of I hope that I did I did it consistently, but I did it. Uh, people maybe don't notice because if you're reading fast, you don't notice. Um, so I didn't put inverted commas around her father's talk, for instance, um, and I I just let it go as if as if he was talking as if it was third person. Um, and that's a sort of other translation, a translation of one person's speech into another person's speech. Um, so I, I took quite a long time to arrive at these solutions. So the first thing about appropriation, I didn't really think about until I was sort of halfway through. Um, I was so close and I was, you know, I was living a lot um, in Greece in this, in, you know, by the synagogue, talking to people. I was so much in the, the atmosphere and, and everything that I really didn't think about worry about that I was, was not Jewish. Um, and I learned a lot from the prayer books, the, the order of service and so on, and from Nikos Savalakis. Um, then when we got towards publication, I thought, I, I seem to have written a Holocaust novel, um, but I'm not, do I, am I, should I? Um, but I was very, very glad. I mean, I just did it from a point of view of, 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 of describing the things and, and from the knowledge that I had learned from other people. And I was very glad that the Jewish Chronicle said that um, authenticity seeps off every page. So I was delighted about that. The deeper thing about should I, write as I for somebody whom I've invented who was a character who was born in Crete. I, talk, I thought a lot about that. And then I thought, um, I think my, you know, my love for, for people whom I have known for 40 years and living very closely with them, I think, I hope it allows me to. And also that I get, I get Crete in its complexity. Um, you know, I, I walked around the battlefields um, I've walked up the mountains. I've and I've just, I just thought I'll go with this and see what happens. Um, but it is a big question these days about appropriation, and I think rightly. And when I teach poetry, for instance, um, people sometimes feel very strongly about things that happen that are not their own experience. And you know, I have to help students with saying, well, maybe you should make clear your own position on this. 
and then do the poem from that point of view rather than trying to appropriate the this person whom you've made up or you don't know it's it is a, a very interesting question Okay, I think probably we've got uh, time for one more question, uh, Rhonda. I don't know what, how you feel, but um, we've yeah, got quite right. a quite a um, a deep, uh, profound mm -hmm. question from Bruce Clark. It's not really it's a sort of open question, and it's not strictly a literary question either. But I'd be interested to hear your reactions. Uh, he says, ten years ago, uh, I think one could confidently say that the idea of a compulsory religion-based population exchange was horrifying to a modern and 21st century sensibility. And he wonders, as an open question, whether it seems fractionally less horrifying now after the rise of populist nationalism and the decline of liberal optimism. Mm -hmm. Have we gone backwards? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Well, sitting in Britain now, I think we have gone backwards in all sorts of things. <laughs> but, um, um, about Greece, I don't know. There's an answer here from Tassos Krikoukis. Yes, you, do you want to read it? Yes, he, he says, have we gone back, backwards? He says, I don't think so. We're progressing towards the right direction. Golden Dawn has been eradicated in very difficult times economically. That's been a victory for Greek people and democracy. Inclusion is an in ongoing process, a must. I see the job, important job done by the municipality of Athens for inclusion of migrants and refugees. And the mayor of Athens illuminated the city hall in memory of the tragedy of the Holocaust. I think there is hope as far as the progress of inclusion is concerned. So that's, that's a hopeful answer. Good. I think that's, that's sorry to risk. Go ahead. Well, I don't want. Maybe I should just leave it on a positive note. But I, I agree. I have a sense that Greece has gone forward in this respect, and of course, the dismantling of Golden Dawn was huge. But sadly, uh, America, oh, we have not gone forward. We are going back really fast, and it's really quite terrifying over here. So um, I'm glad that I, I agree. I think it's going forward in Greece, but wish I could say the same for my country. Yes, and for mine, I mean, um, just just yesterday, the um, the Home Office admitted that it had illegally, against all international law, taken away the mobile phones of many, many asylum seekers and re refugees um, who couldn't contact their family for three months because the Home Office had their phones. And that was illegal. And the pushback policy that our Home Secretary is now advocating is just horrible. So, so... Um, you know, I, I, I do sympathize with Bruce's point. Okay, I think that's pretty much exhausted the question. So I'll hand back to Rhonda to, to wind up, I think. Well, I want to thank everyone for giving us so much to work with on the level of a tra a metaphor, uh, translation, inclusion, exclusion, and, and, and left us with a keen sense how much more work we have to do, is, which came out especially in that last question. But I want to thank everyone, especially our speakers and our previous speakers and our very active audience members for a very wonderful discussion that gives us a lot to, to continue to mull over. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.